how's it going? Hi. <clears throat> how's everybody out there? Sorry, I'm fidgeting. I always fidget in the beginning in the beginning there because it says I'm going live and then it says you're live. So I never really know if I'm live and I can fidget or if I'm you know, or if I'm, I mean, I mean, if I'm not live and I can fidget for a second or if I'm live. Anyway, you know, I'm just an amateur at this, but um, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming to my daily program with the Island Free Library. I am Kristen. I'm the director of the library and amateur move fair. That's my speaker on. Um, and I welcome you to this program. This is Frankenstein Tea. It does happen every day. It generally almost always happens live at 3 p.m. That's when I started it uh, in winter. 3 p.m. was a nice time to have some tea and sort of take a time out. And I continue with that because I still believe that, you know, if you're working or doing chores or have been, what's this hair doing right here? Um, have been, um, you know, take a nice time out with me and sit back and relax and let me read you a story. That's what this program is about. Um, staying connected through story. And um, that's it. Staying connected through story. Boy, I don't think it gets easier than that. Hi, Dad. Should we say anything else besides that, Dad? Staying connected through story? I don't know. I'll tell you. I'll tell you something else. Look what I made. Ooh, a little bloody. Mm. Uh, today is my day off and I am at home doing this program and I just had a lovely visit with my mom and our mutual friend and um, I sort of had to run out of that visit and say I'll see you in a couple hours I'll be back later for dinner but I gotta go read and my mom said what are you reading I said I don't know yet um, lucky for me I had a I have one of this book that I found a few weeks ago at home, checked out to me. Um, it is from the library collection. I have read from this. I think this will be the third story I've read from this. And um, I mentioned my mom and that she, I didn't know what I would read because she, she loves not the author of this story. She doesn't know her, but uh, she loves the character of this story. So I sent her a private link because she can't always get on, especially when she's out on Block Island. So maybe she'll be able to join us. I'm not sure. But thank you all for coming. And I'm glad you're able to join us. And, um, and I hope you like this story. This is um, by Megan Mayhew Bergman. The name of this book is Almost Famous Women and it's stories. Today, we're actually reading a book about a famous woman for sure. I'm not sure how she fell into the almost famous women. This is what I put on Facebook as a link. Burl Markham. Burl Markham in 1936. Uh, this book, Megan Mayhew Bergman's book, Almost Famous Women, is part of the library collection. You can come and take this out when it's not checked out to me. Uh, it was published by Scribner in 2015. And I'll have just one more sip. And I'll read you this nice short story. Well, <laughs> let's hope it's nice. <laughs> How'd everybody do after yesterday's? How'd you do after yesterday's, Dad? Any thoughts about that? Um, this short story is called A High Grade Bitch Sits Down for Lunch. Kenya, 1925. But this girl, who was to my knowledge very unpleasant, and we might even say a high grade bitch, can write rings around all of us. Ernest Hemingway on Burl Markham. The sun was setting over Lake Nakuru, peering through lavender clouds to leave a golden trail across the water. Burl leaned against the brick wall of the stable to watch the lake. The horses were munching their hay and later she'd groomed the filly. Or maybe she'd ride the stallion out for the first time, the one she'd gotten for nothing at an auction a few weeks ago the one with the perfect bloodline. 
the one who killed a man with his hooves and teeth in the corner of a stall in Nairobi. If the filly was her favorite, the stallion was her hope. She ignored his name because she would give him a new one. She'd give him a new life. He would be reborn into glory on the track and the customers would line up at her door. Why don't you ride him already? She chided herself. You know you can do it. You'll have to do it if you want to make your money back and God knows you need money. Her servant and friend, Kibi, whom she'd known all her life, told a client yesterday, Masiba is fearless. She's been riding racehorses since she was 11. True, she'd been raised in Nairobi by a father who raced thoroughbreds, managed a troubled farm, and forgot her birthday. True, a horse had picked her up in his mouth when she was seven and thrown her. Still, she still had the purple scar on her neck. She could throw a spear like the Nandi. She could hunt. She rode a half-broken motorcycle over the vacant, muddy road from Nakuru to Nairobi when she got lonely, after dark, when you could hear the lions. Once, when she had to pee, an elephant rose from the dark brush and startled her. She ran back to the motorcycle with her wet pants not entirely up. You didn't stand down the elephant? Kibi asked when she told him, feigning disbelief. I'm brave, she said, not an imbecile. She poured herself a glass of wine, measuring it because the bottle had had to last a week. A week without guests. She went back to leaning against the stable. She sipped the wine and watched enormous salmon-colored clouds of flamingos drag their overturned heads across the muddy shallows of Nukuru. Deafening bird life meant a constant stream of shit on the racetrack, but her horses were too well-trained to stop and smell it or lick at it the way her dogs did. I want to be alone when I turn the stallion out, she thought, looking for his proud head over the stall door. I want him to know me as his master, his alpha and omega. She drank more wine, eyes back on the sunset. She could see the silhouettes of water buffalo grazing by the lake, followed, she knew, by clouds of black flies and the threat of river blindness. She knew a stable boy who'd poured boiling water down his back to relieve itching caused by the flies. One bite from a fly like that on the stallion's belly and she'd be thrown and broken, left for dead in the ring. Have I had lunch? She wondered, touching her flat stomach. No, she had not. Might as well do it now and call it dinner. Recently divorced and broke, she lived alone in a small white canvas tent underneath the racetrack stands. Her bed was covered in zebra skin. She kept tins of beans next to bottles of wine and boxes of biscuits in a trunk that had once belonged to her father. She never ate much. Meager eating was good for keeping her figure and her figure was an asset, on a horse and in the bedroom. She wanted to look good in clothes and out of them. Cross-legged on the ground, she spread the beans with her fork and took increasingly quick bites. Today is the day to ride the stallion, she thought, and the light won't last forever. She stood up and brushed off her legs. She locked up the dogs. She pulled her hair away from her face. She took her riding crop from the corner of the tent. She'd always been a cruel person. She knew that, and today it was in her favor. Savage practicality and courage had been bred into her, and facing down a beast of a horse in the last hour of light, she could use that. Burl is easily bored, people said. It was true. She was hungry to feel something every day, and fear is what she felt pulling open the stall door. She relished the feeling, the goose pimples on her arms, her heightened sense of awareness, her singular focus. I will have you, she thought, 
locking eyes with the regal horse. The stallion was enormous, 17 hands high. She could sense the energy he'd built up behind the stall door. She led him to the cross ties and put on his tack, carefully, firmly. He swung his head toward her and she met his face with her elbow. He did it again and again she met him with her elbow. He balked at the bit and began to pull back, but she waited him out, pressing her thumb into the corner of his mouth and he got in. She led him to the ring, careful not to look back, not to show fear. She was the leader and he should follow. She walked the ring, then had him canter and trot. His muscles excited her. They showed potential. They would make her a winner. Holding on to his lead line, she walked closer to his face. Back up, she said. He did it. She pressed his broad chest until he moved. Back up. She leaned into his back legs to make one cross over the other, the way his mother would have done in the paddock when he was young. You're stronger than I am, she said calmly, but I'm more determined than you. Throw me and I'll get back on. I'll whip you raw. They could say what they wanted to about her in town. They could say she was a bad wife, too young. They could say she was cruel. She had a stable all to herself in the evenings and wasn't that better than watching your sad sack of a husband drink himself stupid, fighting him off because you didn't want to sleep with a flaccid, unshowered maniac? Yes, the empty stable was better, even if it meant being unable to buy new clothes. Even if it meant buying your own horses, the dangerous ones you could afford, the ones who'd been passed over, written off. Don't let your mind wander, she reminded herself, not even for a second. She led the stallion to the mounting block. He shifted as she gripped his mane and swung her leg over him. What man would ever be more exciting than this? she thought, squeezing the horse between her strong thighs. You will respect me, she said, as he began to turn without her cue. His body stiffened and his head began to dip. He was going to throw her. She could feel it. This battle of wills was real and she would win. She would give herself fully. This moment was falling in love. That is a high grade bitch sits down for lunch from a book called Almost Famous Women by Megan Mayhew Bergman. And as I said, available at the Island Free Library once I return it. Liking this book. My dad says, ugh, about yesterday's story. Yeah. That was an hug. Should have had my cocktail for yesterday. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming. It's sunshiny on Block Island. We made it through yet another storm. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, please mask up, social distance, um, wash your hands, treat yourself kindly, treat others kindly. Um, Poppy liked that one. Yeah, that's a good one, right, Poppy? This is a great little book. This book was um, this book was the uh, Butterfly McQueen story, and she was the woman from uh, Gone with the Wind. I'll show you her. She was here, Butterfly McQueen. I'm right at her story. Give me a second. Butterfly McQueen. I think she's Prissy. Is that what her name is in, in uh, Gone with the Wind? And uh, th this was also the one with the uh, women from the concentration camp and their... their um, they get lipstick. They get lipstick from the office from the uh, allies. Is it the allies? Ooh, I don't know. That are saving them. 
And uh, they're like, you know, they're, they put on the lipstick and they're women again is what that little story was about. That was a tough read though. Um, not today's. Today's is, is Burl and, and uh, we'll have to read some Burl Markham. We'll, we'll have to find some. Um, but for now, peace.